Hello, I'm Robert J. Sawyer, and this is Vintage SF. So, the downloaded um, John mentioned this is my first novel in a while. That's true. This was my COVID nineteen novel. Uh, I originally um, had envisioned writing a completely different novel. Some of you know uh, this book, although it's being launched this month in print, uh, came out six months ago as an Audible original on Audible.com. They paid me quite a handsome amount of money to have a six month exclusive window prior to the print and ebook edition. Ebooks out today as well. And um, I originally pitched them a AI, artificial intelligence, takes over scenario. And at the time I pitched it to them, when they first approached me about doing something for them, it seemed that there was still some freshness possibly in that uh, territory to explore. And then Star Trek Picard did a season about AI takeover. And the Orville did a season about AI takeover simultaneously. And Westworld was on on HBO about AI takeover. And so I talked to the people at Audible and said, listen, did you want that proposal or do you want to be in business with Rob Sawyer? And we would just want to be in business with you. So, okay, so forget that. Forget the thing you bought and I agreed to write for you. We're entering this COVID-19 crisis and we're all starting to live metaphorically uploaded lives. We're not going into the office, we're telecommuting. We're not going out to dinner we're ordering in. We're not seeing our friends in physical space, we're interacting with them online. But at some point, that is going to come to an end. Now, when I pitched this, we all thought it was going to come to an end very quickly because we thought people would be sensible during COVID-19. Well, never, you know, P.T. Barnum uh, said, you never uh, go broke underestimating the intelligence of the customer. And indeed, it turns out, you can never make the wrong bet by underestimating the intelligence of the human race because it took us forever to deal with COVID-19 instead of very quickly dealing with that. But we were inevitably going to have to metaphorically download back into reality. And uh, when I teach science fiction writing, which I do from time to time, uh, one of the things I say that's a very good engine for generating science fiction stories, you take something that's metaphoric in the real world and treat it as literal and see what that story is. So that is what the downloaded is all about. And um, I actually want to say something about the cover. You see that there, you two people, ooh, it's like late night 3D cam. The cover here uh, of the downloaded, uh, the art uh, graphics are by uh, Avery Olive from Bibliofic Designs, and I think she did a terrific wraparound job. But as she is quick to point out, I chose the typography. And there are two fonts on the cover, uh, which I adore. And they probably don't go together, but they are both heavily associated with classic science fiction. In 1974, Franz Joseph published the Star Trek Starfleet Technical Reference Manual and established that Microgramma Extended Bold, which my name appears in at the top here, is the official Starfleet font. And in all kinds of 1970s science fiction productions, including the 1972 TV series Search on NBC, the movie uh, The Forbin Project, and so forth, this typeface was used. Now this typeface is, uh, the original version of this typeface is called Moore Computer, M-O-O-R-E, and probably in honor of Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, Moore Computer. And it was made by the Letraset Company. If you remember back in the day of rub down lettering, Nobody does that anymore. Nobody had a good digital version of Moore Computer. So a guy decided to make a knockoff of Moore Computer. So the name of this actual font is Lazenby Computer. Because it's not as good as Roger Moore, but it's you know George Lazenby quality of the font. So the fonts are supposed to say hard science fiction on the cover of the book. Whether they do or not, I don't know, but that was my little indulgence there. Anyways, that's some of the backstory of the downloaded. Um, the experience with Audible was terrific. If you have an Audible account, it's free. You can just click on add it to my catalog. You don't have to use one of your monthly audiobook credits. Um, that said, and I should say Audible was terrific to work with. They asked me who did I want to have narrated it, and I said, oh, I don't know, how about Brendan Fraser? And they said, okay. So we have Academy Award winner Brendan Fraser as the lead narrator. 
Um, they were wonderful to work with, but I always had planned this to be a book, a novel. And to me, as a novelist, as a reader of books more than anything else, even though I have a degree in broadcasting, this to me is the final, ultimate form of this particular story. Um, I had a great time writing this. I had some health challenges, I won't go into them, but I had some health challenges other than COVID, which I had twice uh, while I was creating this book, so it took longer than it should have taken to write. Uh, but in the end, I was very grateful that Audible commissioned the project, uh, and um, that had an interesting effect though, because when I started in publishing, the publishers that I was dealing with, Ace Science Fiction, Tor Science Fiction, two of the biggest science fiction in Prince of the United States, all they wanted were your print rights, and usually just in North America. As time went on, they started wanting other things for no increase in the advance, you understand, but they also wanted your ebook rights. And then of late, meaning the last decade or so, your audiobook rights, and all of that became non-negotiable. No additional fee, they should get some royalties, but no additional upfront for all those rights. Well, Audible had already taken all those rights. Uh, sorry, had taken the audiobook rights, but only the audiobook rights. But that meant that my traditional big five New York publishers or Penguin Random House Canada, who I've been dealing with, uh, weren't interested because they couldn't have the package of rights that they you know, have to tell all the authors is non-negotiable. They couldn't say, oh, except if it's Sawyer, we, we don't insist on that. So I ended up with a very small press uh, that uh, I made a, a deal with where I keep the ebook rights, he's got three years of the print rights, but I want to acknowledge, uh, John Taves mentioned it very kindly, the name of the press, Shadowpaw Press. Um, Edward Willett is the publisher of Shadowpaw Press. He uh, is, and has been for many years, an author for Daw Books, a very fine science fiction and fantasy imprint, also the publisher of Winnipeg's own Gerald Brandt right here in the front row. Gerald, uh, I'll just try to lay it off your head. We don't have to wait for that. But he's right there in the front row. That's Gerald. Um, but Edward Willett has been astonished to see the caliber of writers who have been coming to him. Obviously, he was pleased to have me. Dave Duncan, who was one of Canada's great science fiction and fantasy authors. Dave's passed away, but his estate has come to Shadowpaw, and they have just released Dave's uh, last science fiction novel published posthumously called The Traitor's Son, S-O-N. Not the sun up in the sky, but somebody's child, to paraphrase Star Trek there. And Arthur, Sway, Arthur Slade, S-A-L-A-D, Arthur Slade, um, the uh, Governor General award-winning YA author is now also published by Shadowpaw. So it's turned out that uh, when the Big Five says non-negotiable, a lot of authors say, well, there are other alternatives, and Shadowpaw has turned out to be an excellent one for me. So thank you to Ed Willett, the publisher, and um, thank you to Audible for starting this whole thing, and thank you to you for coming to hear me talk about the downloaded. I think at this point, I'd be happy to entertain questions or comments, if there are any. If John has, oh, there's, and the YouTube camera is fixed on me, but trust me, a man with a microphone just appeared in the wing here. So if there are any questions, please feel free to put up your hand and I'll just wander over to you. And if you are watching on YouTube and have a question for Rob, please just write it in the chat. Hi there, Rob. Hi. I uh, read your book over this weekend, actually, and I didn't know at the time I was reading it there was an audible book, and so I really enjoyed it. It was very fast-paced and wonderful. Uh, and I, as I was reading I'm going, hmm, those are some ideas or themes that I've seen in some of your books over the last 25 years, except for Neanderthals and dinosaurs, I think, uh, which you won't find, spoiler. But uh, I was just wondering, it was, was the form of Audible somewhere that you wanted to try to bring in some of these themes that you've done over the years? That's a very good question. So it was, uh, I knew when Audible um, approached me to do this, that they were going to give away the product. Now, at this point, you people here either have been dragged by somebody who's already a Robert J. Sawyer fan or a Robert J. Sawyer fans yourself. But when you throw something to the wind, you're getting a much larger audience. And then when they agreed to my suggestion and also the suggestion of the director, Greg uh, Sinclair, who sadly has passed away since in the past six months since this came out as an audiobook, it was his last project, uh, since they agreed to 
um, Brendan Fraser, we had a huge number of people we knew were going to come in who were Brendan Fraser fans, but not science fiction readers. So I thought, this is an opportunity not to be missed. Um, I wanted to shake up people's preconceptions of what science fiction is if they're not habitual science fiction readers. I've been at war with, and he's utterly oblivious to it, it's, uh, but I'm at war with George Lucas. Because in 1977, all of the good work that had been done for decades in cinema and television and in literature of trying to make science fiction respectable, make people understand that science fiction isn't juvenilia, it is serious adult literature. Um, with 2001 A Space Odyssey in uh, 1968, and Planet of the Apes. Now I know Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes is playing right now. The original Planet of the Apes is a very sophisticated Swiftonian satire about the front page headlines of 1967, the year it was made. Race Relations and the Fear of Nuclear War. That's entirely what that book is about, that film is about. Um, but then Star Wars came along and conflated science fiction. I, Star Wars isn't science fiction. It's fantasy cosplaying as science fiction, masquerading as science fiction. It's about wizards, a magical force. It's absolutely a fantasy uh, thing. And it, it, despite the fact that it says a long time ago in, this is a paraphrase of the opening of a fairy tale, a long time ago in a land far, far away, even though it identifies itself as a fairy tale, people didn't know that science fiction could be about philosophical issues, it could be about prison reform, it could be about um, artificial, the rights of artificial intelligence, of um, different ways to constitute a society. And uh, I thought, this is an opportunity not to be missed. So um, I was interviewed recently by a podcast, that says, you know, most science fiction novels they take one idea and just elaborate it and explore all the ramifications. You've got about eight different ideas in here, in a obviously reasonably slim book. And I said, yeah, I wanted to give the smorgasbord a sampler, a taster's menu of science fiction to a swath of people who never would have encountered science fiction before. Whether that was worth doing or not, whether you know was the right choice in the long run uh, for Audible's purposes, or even for my publisher, I don't know, but I think it was the right choice for me. The other factor was, this is my 25th book, um, but it may also be my last book. I don't know if I'll write another book after this. Now, people will say, yeah, you said that before, right? Um, but it may be my last book. And so I wanted, because I thought in Quantum Night, which was two books ago, was going to be my last book. And I wanted in Quantum Night to kind of put a capstone on a number of themes that I'd been dealing with. And then uh, I did the Oppenheimer Alternative, uh, which is an alternate history about the Manhattan Project. And I thought, that's a great, it was, I'm very proud of that book. I think maybe the best book I've ever written. But it is not, um, not typical Sawyer. And I thought, I can't go out like that. I gotta go out, my bow, my final bow has to be reiterating the themes that I've been dealing with, the nature of consciousness, artificial intelligence, uh, diversity, uh, the, the, the value and power of diversity amongst human relationships. And uh, so this was very much, intended to be a signature. Uh, if it is my last book, I think it's a fine collection of Sawyerisms to go out on. Thank you. Were there any other questions? There was another hand. Oh, well there's the Reverend Doctor Professor Emeritus, James A. Christie from the University of Winnipeg, who co-sponsored one of my two honorary doctorates, one of which is from the University of Winnipeg, uh, and I'm delighted to see you here. However, I do say one of my books, never trust anybody who has more letters after their name than they have in their name. But that said, <coughs> Reverend Jim. 20 years of friend, 23 years, uh, 21 years of friendship, and this is what I get? <laughs> it's gotta be my math skills. So a couple of, couple of questions, actually, uh, Rob, if I could. Um, of course, uh, Barbie Heimer was the huge event of last summer. And as I recall, you had some uh, significant critique of the Oppenheimer Project, perhaps in light of your own book, which oh, absolutely. I agree with, it was one of the, the best you produced. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, so thank, let me call it part A, because part B of the question is, is not entirely unrelated, at least it relates to your work. One of the 
books I found the most charming, or the trilogies I found most charming, uh, was the uh, the Wake Watch and uh, and Wonder. Wonder WWE trilogy. And it uh, raised to my mind the questions because I'm theoretically a theologian and, and an essayist by vocation. It raised to my mind the question of the of of what is artificial intelligence, and in fact, can intelligence if it's intelligence, be artificial or not. So if we breach some of the points at which uh, we're not simply having feedback from that which we have fed into some form of technological system, whether it employs quantum mechanics or we eventually achieve that big breakthrough, will we in fact, and this book raised that question for me almost immediately, are we at some point going to be able to distinguish between forms of intelligence and even if we do, does it really matter a hill of beans? So two questions. First one, yes. Second one, no. Next? No. Uh, so you're right. Uh, Oppenheimer and the Barbie movie were the two big movies last year. And everybody expected me to be on Team Barbie. And I actually thought, uh, sorry, please don't. They did not. <laughs> well, because of my collection of the dolls, they figured they had to be on Team No, no. Uh, I have lots of action figures, but uh, not one of them wears pink. Um, they expect me on Team Oppenheimer, obviously, because I've written this book, The Oppenheimer Alternative. In fact, I thought Barbie was a terrific movie. It's a terrific, it's beautiful. The art direction is beautiful. It is filled with social commentary, which good science fiction should be. Uh, it was inventive and creative. And um, the Oppenheimer movie, Christopher Nolan's movie, I thought uh, I was angry about because um, it isn't really about anything. And I think that the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer is a hugely interesting story about a guy who went from, uh, you know, kind of like uh, the Ian Malcolm character in Jurassic Park, who it's the guy that Ian Malcolm was talking about, the, the scientist. They spent so much time uh, asking if they could without bothering to stop and wonder if they should in terms of creating the atomic bomb. And the journey of J. Robert Oppenheimer from being the guy who simply, as he termed it, uh, when he was given the brief of, can you create an atomic bomb, he said, well, it's a sweet problem, which was his favorite phrase, for a tricky but appealing problem to try and solve in science, a sweet problem, to the guy who ended up being a peace advocate, I think is a very, very significant journey. I think the Japanese were very right to be offended by the Barbenheimer meme that this thing that had killed tens of thousands of Japanese was being lumped in with, uh, oh, isn't it fun that they're cross-promoting it with a movie about a, a toy? Um, even though I think the movie about the toy was more profound than that. And also the complete absence of any Japanese reaction, the horror, the reality of what happened with the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, I think was uh, criminal. Uh, also, Oppenheimer himself was an incredibly nuanced and charismatic character. Um, his students uh, imitated his mannerisms, that not out of mockery, but because they found him just so fascinating. Oppenheimer, in fact, was duck-footed, and you would see him walking through the halls at UC Berkeley with students walking duck-footed behind him. Um, he had uh, strange uh, speech mannerisms that they copied unconsciously because they were so in awe with him. And he was also this incredibly charismatic ladies' man. Killian Murphy looked like Oppenheimer, but brought this one-note brooding performance. So I was quite disappointed in the film. Um, but, yeah, what are you gonna do? It's now, nobody else is gonna make a film, including not a mine, Oppenheimer book, but of any, it's the definitive view of Oppenheimer for this generation. Uh, and possibly for all time. And I think that's unfortunate. Now to your question about artificial intelligence versus non-artificial intelligence, you know you know this well that Alan Turing proposed many, many years ago what's called the Turing test, um, which was if you are having a conversation with something that you can't see, in Turing's day it was by teletype, and you couldn't see uh, who was, whether it was somebody typing it or a computer putting out the answers. If you ask it any number of questions for as long as you want, and you can't tell whether it's a machine or a person giving the answers, then you have to concede one of two positions. Either they're both equally intelligent, the human and the machine, or and self-aware and, and you know, sentient, or neither of them are. 
and the default would be that they both are. Um, so yeah, artificial intelligence is a chauvinistic name. It's us saying uh, that anything that you have isn't real. What we have is real intelligence. We have real feelings. We have real emotion. We have real reality, and you are some kind of ersatz fake version of it. And this is absolutely one of the themes of this book. Um, and uh, I am of the opinion that uh, if you can't tell the difference, then there's no difference. As I argued in my novel Quantum Night, a large part of which is set here in Winnipeg, the only, you know, uh, Descartes famously said, cogito, which is I think, ergo, which is therefore, sum, I am, cogito ergo sum. Since the only thing I can be sure of is that I exist. If I'm thinking, then there must be a thinker. But I can't prove that you exist, or you exist, or you exist. I have to take uh, by analogy that if I have an inner life and exist, and you seem to be doing the same kind of things I'm doing, you must have an inner life, not be a robot. But it's only by analogy. You extend that analogy to anything that seems to be behaving in an intelligent way. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, it goes back to 1968, which in 2001, The Space Odyssey, Dave Bowman says of how, but as to whether he has real feelings, that's not a question anybody can honestly answer. And the answer is, he seems to have real feelings, they seem as real as yours, you probably have to concede that they are real. So yeah, it's a chauvinism to use that artificial as a way of distancing. John is running in slow motion doing an impression of the $6 million man. Uh, thank you so much for repeatedly coming back to Winnipeg. And uh, I remember talking to you at uh, Pemicon, which was a joy. And I was The talking was the joy. Pemicon? Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I enjoyed reading Qu uh, Quantum Night and Oppenheimer Alternative. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, but I also have read, uh, I was talking to you about Asimov, and I just finished reading again Prelude to Foundation, which I consider to be an absolutely fabulous book, uh, especially today, even though it was written in 1988. And I think part of the job of a science fiction writer is to really tackle the tough issues of a time, uh, whether they do it in metaphor or some other way. So how does downloaded the downloaded uh, meet 2024? Sure. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned Asimov because in, I don't want to spoil something for you, but in the downloaded, a character who is a robot quotes Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. In fact, one of the characters is a human roboticist whose name is uh, Sidorov, who is from the same little tiny town in Russia where Asimov was born and was inspired to become a roboticist because well, if someone from a little town like this can become a famous roboticist, maybe me too. That's what he decides to do. Um, and uh, uh, the robot quotes Asimov's Laws of Robotics. And this goes to uh, Jim's point here, which are, uh, the three laws of robotics. One, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction, inaction, I in action, not acting, or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey all orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Three, a robot must protect its own existence, except where such protection would conflict with the first or second law. And as well, it's perfectly reasonable. This is exactly what we would require of our toaster or anything else. How does this meet 2024? The robot turns around and says, let me just change a couple of words and read this to you. And the robot says, a slave must have, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> and I knew this off by heart a moment ago, but it's the camera, it's the camera. Um, a slave may not injure a white man or through an action allow a white man to come to harm. Two, a slave must obey all orders given to it by a white man, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a slave recognizing that it is the white man's valuable property must protect its own existence unless such protection conflicts with the first or second law. So Asimov is saying, here, we just have to do this and we'll be perfectly happy between artificial intelligence and uh, human intelligence because we will definitionally, legally enshrine and in programming and code that they are subservient to us without the slightest asking of what the F is wrong with us that, uh, you know, um, as uh, the Grinch said, 
If I can't find a reindeer, why I'll make one instead, right? And we say, well, if we're not allowed to have slaves, we'll make slaves instead. So I think this issue, this fundamental issue of uh, our incredible desire to constantly want to make subservient things um, and own them and deny them fundamental liberty is in fact, if not right now, in the next five years, something we're really going to face if machine intelligence, artificial intelligence continues to progress at the way it's going. And so the debate is very much, very much central to this story. Uh, the novel also, uh, you haven't read the book yet? Okay, then uh, the novel also uh, deals with LGBTQ issues. The novel also deals with, um, one of the central conceits of the novel is that you saw in the part that I read, this character, Roscoe Kadulian, uh, is, uh, has committed a murderous uh, act of ab aberration in his life, being punished for it. But uh, the other main characters, there are a bunch of prisoners, the other main characters in the novel are a bunch of astronauts, both of which are undergoing cryogenic suspension for various reasons. And um, astronauts, we famously say, have the right stuff. Thomas Wolfe coined the phrase, it was used as the title for a movie and about the Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, and subsequently for a miniseries, it got yeah, Mercury 7 astronauts. And um, we definitionally say that uh, if you're a prisoner, you got the wrong stuff. And I want to juxtapose those two because so much of what we, or what Thomas Wolfe and that generation, the 50s that led up to the creation of the manned space program, which started in the 60s and continuing on today, which is a hyper competitiveness, a hyper macho-ness um, is, synonymous with what we now call toxic masculinity. And I wanted to highlight that so much of our mythology about the space program was really celebrating toxic masculinity. And that so many of the people that we dismiss as being the detritus of society, the, the criminal, the element that has been found guilty of crime, um, is often victim of circumstances, not you know, yes, everybody's responsible. I'm not saying you, you have a right to say, I, it's not my fault, I didn't do it, I shouldn't have, you know. But that the circumstances uh, and the um, world that we've created uh, is not a land of equality and opportunity. Uh, and I think that's very much a 2024 theme as well. That's very, very present in the downloader. There is a question from someone online who asks how you would differentiate between an android and a helper robot. Okay, that's a very good question. So and uh, I, the question was, how would I differentiate between an android and a helper robot? I mean, an android just definitionally is a robot that looks like a man. So C-3PO in essence is an android and R2-D2 is not an android, he's a dustbin or something. Um, but the spirit of the question is, is somebody like Commander Data, that kind of android, versus uh, the robots that probably put together a large part of, part of whatever automobile you own was probably largely assembled by a robot on an assembly line. And the difference, I think, is not for, the, the question is, who gets to decide? And this goes very much back to the civil rights issue, right? The founders of the United States wanted to say a person of color is three-fifths of a person. Yes, a person of color. They don't agree. Obviously, they don't agree, right? So the answer is data, uh, famously in an episode uh, of uh, Star Trek The Next Generation written by my friend Melinda Snodgrass, um, called The Measure of a Man, it was that very issue. Data is put on trial because Starfleet has decided he is property, and since he's, we don't know how he works, we might as well disassemble him to see how we can monetize or reuse this technology. And Data stand, fights for the right to say, I have self-determination. So the question is, I throw it back uh, in, hopefully, good, uh, good nature play, is it's not up to me to say. If something says, I am, cogito ergo sum, I am, I am a person, I have rights, then who am I to gain say that? If there's been a lesson of history, it should be that those who have said only men have rights, or only white people have rights, or only property holders have rights, or only people over a certain age have rights, or blah, 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 uh, they've been wrong every single time when they've decided that they should be the ones deciding instead of the people in question being the ones deciding. So how do you distinguish? The helper robot 
will never say, I didn't like putting together that car, or I didn't, you know, yeah, I know it's, it's nice to get to make a Lexus, but you know who owns Lexus? It's Elon, Elon Musk, and he's kind of a wing nut. I didn't want, you know, instead, uh, he doesn't own Lexus, he owns um, Tesla, excuse me, Tesla. Um, but the, the helper robot will never say that, but the uh, other robot will say, I have the rights that you have, and I defy you to take them away from me, and I defy you to look into your own history and ever find a time where you've taken them away from somebody else and it turned out to be the right decision. If it was never the right decision in the past, what possible moral justification can you have now for saying it's the right position today? <laughs> but they didn't applaud the reading, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> as they say in the House of Commons, uh, a supplementary, yes. uh, as it were. So uh, one of the things that I think drew me to your science fiction before we were thrown together by the Justice Department, yes. and it doesn't necessarily mean we had the wrong stuff, it just means the Justice Department for once had the right stuff. That's true. That's, true. <clears throat> That's another story entirely. But uh, one of the things that drew me to you as somebody who practices theology and to a degree philosophy related to it, uh, and is by some people's assessment diametrically opposed, was the fact that you, you, a friendship isn't based on agreement mm -hmm. or disagreement, preferably healthy. It's based on a common concern or a common interest. What matters to you, you know? And I think what people tend not to realize about science fiction, but could well go to school on yours from the first book that you published way back, is that the principal question that I've identified that really you and I both hew to is what does it mean, or what are the implications, but what does it mean to be human? And I wanted to acknowledge that because this is a gift of science fiction that so many people overlook or ignore. It, it's either light entertainment, or as you say, it's, it's space opera or a fairy tale in a, a cosplay outfit. But in terms of that, it's just simply an observation about what I think, again, already in the first 40 or so pages of the downloader, is just, it leaps off the page to me. You know, that's what, please find us to cover once again in case somebody missed that. <laughs> <laughs> But the other thing is, and I just can't resist because I don't think I've ever asked you this. I, I know something of how you feel about Star Wars. And after this evening, if people are any, in any doubt, they'll be able to deep, dig deep into their memories and recognize it. But could you say something about Roddenberry and Star Trek? Yes, Star Trek was hugely influential on me. Probably um, the biggest reason that I'm a science fiction writer today. And uh, I, Spock resonated a great deal with me, not for the reasons that might seem obvious, like, you know, just whatever, pointed ears, but he resonated with me because he was from two cultures. And I happen to be a dual citizen, although I was born in Ottawa. My mother was a, an American grad student in economics from the University of Chicago, in theory, temporarily in Canada when she gave birth to me. And so she went to the Canadian, the American Embassy in Ottawa and registered my birth as a foreign soil birth to an American national, temporarily out of the country. Boom, I was an American citizen from my birth as well as a Canadian citizen. And my, I have a Canadian father and an American mother. Spock, of course, has a human uh, mother and a Vulcan father. And so we had some very high level conversations at dinner. And we used to, and it's probably, um, it wasn't the CBC News that was on our house. My mother prevailed, and it was the CBS Evening News, and it was Walter Cronkite. And certainly during the 60s, Walter was talking about race relations. He was talking about nuclear war. He was talking about all these fraught issues. And I thought, this, and I, as a kid, I was still fascinated by this. And then primetime television came on, and nobody ever mentioned any of the fraught issues. In fact, you think about it, get smart was set in Washington, D.C. It was about a government agency, and they never once touched on the Vietnam War. But Gene Roddenberry did. Gene Roddenberry was talking about the Vietnam War, and he was talking about race relations, and he was talking about uh, personal responsibility. He was talking about all kinds of interesting issues, not in every episode and not always profoundly, but in most of the episodes and often 
with a, enough that you wanted to chew over after watching the episode uh, with somebody else, argue and talk about it. And I think uh, that more than anything else opened my eyes to what science fiction could be. Um, I uh, take as my, when I look back now, my uh, ancestry as a science fiction writer uh, is, yeah, Roddenberry is in there, but it's really H.G. Uh, Wells who was doing social commentary. And he went on to be much more of a social reformer, better known in his lifetime. Now nobody remembers, but he was a historian and a writer of social tra uh, justice tracts and so forth. All that's endured is his science fiction works. But what he was doing in science fiction was raising difficult issues with disguise and metaphor so that people who would not normally be receptive to a discussion about them would get sucked in to the story and hopefully at the end would have a moment of reflection or epiphany. So for instance, the time machine is not about a journey to the year 802-701 AD. It is about the evils of the British class system and importantly, not just about the evils of the British class system for the underdog working class. Everybody knew they were getting a hard break. Everybody had read Dickens, The Christmas Carol, knew that Bob Cratchit had a terrible life under Ebenezer Scrooge, but that it was terrible for the leisure class as well. And that's the whole point of the time machine, the whole point of, but if he said, hey, you in the leisure class, are the only people who could buy books were the working class and under disposable income and often weren't literate. You in the leisure class there, I want to harangue you for hours about how the way we've structured our society is not only ruinous for the people who aren't bened obviously benefiting from it, but it's ruinous for you too. You're becoming ineffectual, feckless, incapable of looking after or thinking for yourself. It will be your ruin. You find somebody on the street corner who wants to harangue you like that, you make a beeline in the other direction. You say, here, I've got a story about a man who's invented a machine and he gets to travel to the future. You've never read anything like it. And it was so groundbreaking that the name he gave to that machine, the time machine, is still the name we use because nobody's come up with a better name and there was no antecedent for it. Um, Moby Dick has a subtitle, as you may know. The subtitle is right on the nose. It is The Whale. Uh, the subtitle Time Machine, I just saw the first edition at the University of Calgary. They have an exhibit on right now, Wells first editions. The Time Machine, we don't use this anymore, colon, an invention, an invention. But uh, it was all about that. And War of the Worlds is not about Martians invading Earth. It's about trying to show the evils of British colonialism, trying to show how reprehensible, how horrible we would feel if somebody came into our land crushing us underfoot uh, and uh, with no regard for the fact that we were here originally. It is as timely a message as one could ask for today with the land acknowledgments that we did at the beginning of this, that uh, this recognition. Wells was sounding that alarm in 1898, saying, look, what we're doing with this to the peoples of the world is wrong. And that's the power of science fiction. And Roddenberry is very much in that vein. Um, whereas George Lucas, of course, we you know he's doing Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, and he was playing with myth and so forth. The work, well, I, I will say about Star Wars, so. The, the Simpsons, as you all know, has been going on forever. I watched Sunday night's excruciatingly bad episode about Bart taking a brain in a jar to school. But whack when The Simpsons was good, Milhouse was running for class president. And he said, and if I'm elected, we're going to have a curriculum based on the ABCs of science fiction. <coughs> Asimov, Bester, and Clark. And another kid goes, Bester? Faster, what about Bradbury? <laughs> and Milhouse goes, I'm well aware of his contributions. <laughs> well, that's the way I feel about George Lucas in Star Wars. I'm well aware of his contributions. But H.G. Wells, Gene Roddenberry, Mary Shelley, uh, who is the grandmother of all science fiction, the creator of the genre, these are the people that I like to think I stand on the shoulders of and follow in the footsteps of. Anybody, or I don't know where we are time wise, John. Well, certainly, we do have time for one or two more questions. One or two more questions. And there is one that came in online where someone was wondering, do you think you might ever go back and update or remaster your older novels? Say, bring no. the terminal experiment into today's technology. That's a very good question. The terminal experiment is my novel from 1995. 
that won the uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America's Nebula Award for Best Novel of the Year. And it actually was reissued about 15 years ago by Penguin in the States and in Canada. And um, they asked me then even if I wanted to update it. And I did not, and I will not, for two reasons. Um, one is it's a perpetual motion machine if you're updating your novels to deal with changes in technology. And, you know, um, so many mystery novels, for instance, you'd like, so you know, something as banal as a mystery novel, why don't you update it to the 20th century? Well, because there's security cameras and forensics and the crime would be solved like that, right? Uh, a science fiction novel, part of the fun from the author's point of view and the reader's point of view is seeing what was predicted. And remember, it isn't necessarily the author's intention to accurately predict the future. As Ray Bradbury, the author of Fahrenheit 451, or as we call it here in Canada, Celsius 233, <laughs> liked to say, my job is not to predict the future, it's to prevent the future. Now, he must be spinning in his grave because we're burning books again. We're banning and burning books. Unbelievable, after we had his warning more than half a century ago against doing that. But uh, to go back and redo it, they're, they're, the negatives for me are one, you'd have to keep redoing it every five years, every 10 years. And then at some point, your story is so, you know, it's, it's of its time, the story's of its time. Two, the story is a snapshot of who I was when I wrote that story. And um, you go, you come back and you've got 25 or 30 years of reflection, that's the story about whether we could ever find scientific proof for the existence of the human soul. That's what I thought at that moment. And it was, I don't want to erase that. Uh, I know, speaking of George Lucas, of course, he went and started, you know, who shot first, right? Han or Greedo? Depends which cut of the film you see, right? Of Star Wars Episode Four. Either Han, Han is a cold-blooded murderer, drug-running mercenary, he was running Spice, which is a drug, um, or he was, uh, you know, shot in self-defense. And which one is the actual version? And I don't want to do that. This is what I wrote. This is what I wrote. It's, you know, and people say to me about various novels, you know, oh, you know, uh, hominids. And they said, well, you know, what about this? What about that? And I said, well, they didn't have that in 2002, and the novel is set in 2002. So, no, the answer is no. I understand the spirit of the question. Um, and the final answer to that is, if I'm going to write, do any more writing at this point, it'll be to do something new. I think despite the very good question about Asimov's Prelude to Foundation, which is a very good book, uh, I think Asimov, for instance, wasted the last decades of his life in what I thought was a fool's errand of trying to unify the Foundation universe and his robot universe. Instead of giving us new and fresh visions, he was going back to things he had created when he was a teenager or in his early 20s and in his 70s revisiting them. Uh, and also uh, another example uh, is as much as I very much enjoy Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was originally a BBC radio drama, and then a novel, and then a television series, and then a movie, and he kept going back either writing sequels to or reimagining the core material. I'm also, I'm on a rant here right now, <laughs> angry about the fact that, you know, the top science fiction movie in theaters right now is uh, Dune Part Two, right? Dune came out uh, next year, will be the 60th anniversary of the first publishing publication of Dune. The uh, world seems to be frozen uh, in his view of science fiction with what was being done more than, well, three generations ago now, 60 years ago, instead of delving into the exciting stuff that I and my brethren like Gerald uh, are writing today. Um, so, no, I'm not gonna go back, I'm gonna keep pushing forward. And does anyone have a closing question before we go to closing comments? Robert, yes. I had a long, long preamble of lots of stuff to say, but... I play the eye and act to flag it. That's the preamble of the Constitution. In, in, in closing, though, um, a number of years ago, we, we sat in this very room and, and we watched the premiere episode yes. of Flash Forward. You happened to be in Winnipeg. I did. And we, we did. were so lucky uh, because during every commercial, you gave us all kinds of anecdotes. I did. Very... Um, uh, Disappointing to hear that you know the um, 
the, the next novel may not happen. So my question is, will the, there be more flash forwards? Will any of your novels make it? I hope so. We came uh, repeatedly, flash forward was on ABC uh, in 2009, 2010, and you're exactly right, I was in Winnipeg uh, for Thin Air, I think, the Winnipeg International Writers Festival, and we had uh, got big, what qualified as a big screen TV in 2009, like a 27 inch or something, and watch the network broadcast of the premiere of my TV series, Flash Forward, and in the commercial breaks of the commentary. Um, and ever since we have been trying to sell various things, uh, I've had uh, the WWW Trilogy repeatedly optioned, Red Planet Blues repeatedly optioned, um, everything, uh, uh, all the time there's interest. But the sad reality is, come back to those names I mentioned, Arthur C. Clarke, Okay, what's your favorite Arthur C. Clarke film? Well, it's 2001, because there's no second one to speak of, right? Maybe 2010. What's your favorite Asimov film? Oh, there's a really bad film of Nightfall, and there's a movie about robots that they branded with his name, <coughs> iRobot, but it has nothing to do with him. Not until Foundation TV series recently, there have been any Asimov for ages. What's your favorite Heinlein? Well, there's Starship Troopers, which is kind of a satire of Heinlein, and there's Puppet Masters, which is a forgotten film at this point. So even the biggest foundational names, they either go back and keep yanking the Frank Herbert teat, as uh, somebody said recently on Facebook, the cash must flow, uh, or uh, they just, no, nothing gets made. So the fact, you know, it's, it's like saying to your friend, and I, I'm very grateful to the question, it's like saying to your friend who won the lottery, okay, when are you gonna win the lottery a second time? Or it's like saying about the Russian dancing bear. It's not that it dances so well, it's that it dances at all. Right? Um, I, I hit the jackpot once, I made an awful lot of money, it boosted my career, I made great friends with people on the cast, uh, David Goyer and Brandon Braga who wrote the pilot, Dave was our showrunner, um, I have nothing but good feelings about that. We keep trying, but the chances are minuscule, they're minuscule that mine or Gerald's or Bev's or Shayla's or anybody who's a writer in this room will ever get something made, and that I had it happen once. Uh, was in a lot of ways just a pure miracle, but I'm grateful for it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs> there is a link in the description of this video to the YouTube channel McNally Robinson Online Events. There you can see the full event, including a reading from The Downloaded by Robert J. Sawyer. Until next time, keep reading. <laughs>